You see, because it's this high above sea level, the light reaches over the curve of the Earth beyond the horizon. Not the beam itself, but the loom, the glow of it. Tom was standing behind Isabel on the lighthouse gallery, arms around her, chin reaching down to rest on her shoulder. The January sun scattered flecks of gold in her dark hair. It was 1922, and their second day alone on Janus. Back from a few days honeymoon in Perth and straight out to the island. It's like seeing into the future, said Isabel. You can reach ahead in time to save the ship before it knows it needs help. The higher the light, and the bigger the order of lens. The further its beam shines. This one goes just about as far as any light can. Maybe all the times in my life I could have done without, maybe they were all a test to see if I deserve you, is, they were stretched on a blanket on the grass. Three months after Isabel's arrival on Janus, the April night was still almost warm, and tinseled with stars. Isabel lay with her eyes closed, resting in the crook of Tom's arm as he stroked her neck. You're my other half of the sky, he said. I never knew you were a poet, oh, I didn't invent it. I read it somewhere, a Latin poem, a Greek myth, something like that. Anyway, you and your fancy private school education, she teased. It was Isabel's birthday, and Tom had cooked her breakfast and dinner. Maybe all the times in my life I could have done. Shall I get you a cup of tea? Tom asked, at a loss. He was a practical man, give him a sensitive technical instrument, and he could maintain it, something broken, and he could mend it, meditatively, efficiently. But confronted by his grieving wife, he felt useless. Isabel did not look up. He tried again. Some Vincent's powders, the first aid taught to lightkeepers included, restoring the apparently drowned, treating hypothermia and exposure, disinfecting wounds, even the rudiments of amputation. They did not, however, touch on gynecology, and the mechanics of miscarriage were a mystery to Tom. It had been two days since the dreadful storm. Two days since the miscarriage had begun. Still the blood came, and still Isabel refused to let Tom signal for help. Having stayed on watch throughout that wild night, he had finally returned to the cottage after putting out the light just before dawn, and his body begged for sleep. But entering the bedroom he had found Isabel doubled up, the bed soaked in blood. The look in her eyes was as desolate as Tom had ever seen. I'm so, so sorry, she had said. So, so sorry, Tom, then the other wave of pain gripped her and she groaned, and pressed her hands to her belly, desperate for it to stop. Dot set it up to let it echo in the natural sound chamber. Isabel's lips were pale and her eyes downcast. She still placed her hand fondly on her stomach sometimes before its flatness reminded her it was empty. And still, her blouses bore occasional patches from the last of the breast milk that had come in so abundantly in the first days, a feast for an absent guest. Then she would cry again, as though the news were fresh. She stood with sheets in her hands, chores didn't stop, just as the light didn't stop. Having made the bed and folded her nightgown under the pillow, she headed up to the cliff to sit by the graves a while. She tended the new one with great care, wondering whether the fledgling rosemary would take. She pulled a few weeds from around the two older crosses, now finely crystalled with years of salt, the rosemary growing doggedly despite the gales. When a baby's cry came to her on the wind, she looked instinctively to the new grave. Before logic could interfere, there was a moment when her mind told her it had all been a mistake. This last child had not been stillborn early, but was living and breathing. The illusion dissolved, but the cry did not. Then Tom's call from the gallery, on the beach, a boat, told her this was not a dream. 
and she moved as quickly as she could to join him on the way to the dinghy. Isabel's lips were pale and her eyes downcast. She still placed her hand fondly on her stomach sometimes before its flatness reminded her it was empty. And still, 